Okay, thank you for the invitation. I, I think uh, um, I come here to learn, actually, um, because um, I'm hoping to, um, you know, get some seminar activity in the health natural language processing side uh, uh, to do the hackathon, but uh, some of the things that prevent us to do the hackathon in the uh, clinical side is the PHI information embedded in the uh, electronic uh, uh, medical records. So, so I'm the title of my talk is talk about this uh, open house natural language processing. Um, we try to sell this as that for any kind of uh, um, NLP empowered clinical research and applications. If you want to ensure reproducibility you must adopt the open science, open frame for your research, uh, for your solutions. So for those not knowing Mayo Clinic, we is the yearly ranked as uh, number one in the U.S. hospital ranking. So we have, we, we are probably the, from the brand perspective, we are the top one in the healthcare brand, um, just like, uh, other um, brand. So we have about 3,200 staff physicians and the scientists. And our research at Mayo Clinic actually is a very small portion. It's about only 6% of our revenue come from the research. Majority come from the practice. So given that, the, the things that I orient this is that our group is a research lab in that institution. Um, for us to survive there, we must demonstrate our um, usefulness for the practice. And um, luckily, so this, this is the outline. Um, I will do some introduction and talk about issues and the solutions which we currently working on, and also discuss about um, how to make a RP useful in the clinical practice. So um, many of you know, um, at least in the U.S., the healthcare cost per family has been grown dramatically from 2002 to 2016. Uh, you see the numbers. This is kind of threefold increase, but our income didn't really increase that much. Okay. So, so starting this year, healthcare um, become the top, um, uh, beating the um, um, realty, I um, mean, the um, um, constructions become the top one, um, you know, cost uh, um, revenue for the uh, industry. So it's uh, very expensive. And um, then meanwhile, um, then in the U.S., we have this uh, uh, meaningful use, which it tried force about majority of the hospitals to adopt electronic medical records. The primary reason they think uh, using the electronic medical records can if, um, ensure efficiency and uh, help improve the patients. And the second reason is that when you have all those data being um, captured, you probably can use the data for um, you know mining new knowledge to improve the healthcare system. So this come to the concept of learning health system. So learning health system um, is um, a white paper by Institute of Medicine talk about, you know, they want establish a uh, national infrastructure for the learning health system. And uh, so currently uh, in the U.S., the EHR adoption is 90, over 95 percent. So majority of the primary care and um, hospitals, the healthcare institutes, they have uh, um, EMR um, installed and implemented. And the primary function, which they think is that um, giving all those data to be health practice related data to be captured, we should can uh, facilitate a, a learning health system which can seamlessly refine and um, deliver best practice for continuous improvement. Um, so meanwhile, we know that uh, currently, um, after the big bubble of data science, uh, not data science, big data, <laughs> we have another um, hot um, coming up with artificial intelligence. 
So this is a, a slide, an image borrowed from um, the web. It's talk about, you know, the healthcare as a second, you know, <coughs> diagnosis APIs and the personal treatment where the artificial intelligence can come to support. And I'm very happy for that image. They included natural language processing as, uh, you know, one of the main application of machine learning where in the healthcare, uh, natural language processing actually become um, indispensable uh, as one of the technology they must use for any kind of AI work. Um, so this comes to the nature of the EMR records. Um, basically, um, the primary function for electronic medical records uh, is used to record the events and the facilitate the communication among the care team. Of course, uh, you know, um, currently insurance company, they may use this as a, you know, primary um, function, but historically the function of EMR is for recording clinical events and um, recording uh, medical history of the patients and uh, also try to share things among the care team to facilitate the communication. And uh, no matter how hard people implement the EMR system, uh, how, how much inf uh, structure they in encapsulate there, there's significant dependence of the text. Um, when, when there is a lawsuit or misdiagnosis or anything, um, the clinical findings, the gold standard usually come from the clinical notes, which is text. So um, even you have labs or those other things, if you don't document it when there's an issue coming up, um, still the text is the part which you consider as the gold standard. Um, the lab, when, when people use the administrative billing data as a surrogate for clinical data, they can introduce a lot of problems. One significant issue is the coding. Um, I heard of the semantic improbability here. Um, actually, in the medical domain, we did some experiments evaluating the intercoder agreement. We only have about 55% inter-annotator intercoder agreement when they assign the diagnosis codes for, for, uh, for encounter. So it's pretty low. And, um, so the second thing we found is the incomprehensiveness. And this, in that same study, we also found about 20 to 30 percent of the codes were not really um, captured um, by the coders when they assign the billing codes. So those can be, when you come to also to the rare disease, complex disease, there's also some misleading part. So, so in general, um, we, we must use natural language processing or must we have a way to deal with clinical narratives uh, in order for any kind of meaningful use of the EMR data for downstream application. Um, and uh, so we, we always, we, we said in our LPS that we come to rescue, we can bridge in the gap between your human beings and the computational system. Um, and there's um, evidence to, to, um, to showing that RP can be leveraged for detect medical errors and uh, assist the diagnosis of facility research. Um, so this is um, generally how RP being used for uh, mining um, for EMR-based uh, research projects. So you first have the practice generated uh, um, real world um, clinical data, so those are the EMRs. For structure part, uh, we, we, we still needed to go through the normalization due to the different EMR system. They may implement different coding mechanism. So there's a normalization or standardization in press, um, um, part of the picture. But for unstructured data, um, the ability to get the information out of the clinical text it's very important. So this has been um, showing many different applications, uh, cohort identification, data abstraction, healthcare quality, and uh, all those different pieces. And um, so when uh, I show this as a, one of the things that, I, as I mentioned, the one 
when we deal with the use of NLP in the clinical environment, depending on the use case or application, the semantics there can be a little bit different. And how exactly the things be used can be different. This is a simple case for heart failure. So we know how to failure, some of the information coded in structured, some of the information coded in unstructured. Uh, like a problem list, depends on the EMR implementation. Some are structured, in some institutions they are structured, some institutions they are unstructured. And also the quality of life findings and the ejection fraction depends on the institution. Some are structured, unstructured, and also medication. So, however, when you talk to so for those three different use cases of uh, heart failure, uh, I mean, for the NLP system for detecting heart failure related concepts, uh, what they want are actually very different. Um, uh, ask the clinical researcher what they want to identify heart failure cohort for GWAS study. Um, what they want is, uh, you know, their definition of the heart failure patients is different from those for decision support. It's also different from the quality reporting, which is a lot of times um, they are uh, using the, um, you know, kind of standard specification by the quality agency. So, so our semantics when we're dealing with RP happen a lot depending on the, the, the exactly how we deal with the, how we develop that RP algorithms highly depends on how the downstream application will be uh, leveraged. Um, so for those not familiar with the electronic medical records, you know, they're, they look quite different from literature. Um, so you will see um, PHI information there. For example, the 84-year-old, that's the PHI information. The last name is the PHI information, Mrs. Jones. But besides that, you have the clinical concepts there, you know, which many align with those couple of semantic types, diagnosis, environment, medication, family history. They use some standard of vocabulary, uh, ICD-10, X norm. Those are meaningful use standards uh, adopted in the US. Um, so that's generally how um, the RP um, applied to the clinical domain is to try to extract clinical information from the text and they utilize this for downstream application. And how exactly to use NLP results highly depends on the specific application um, those uh, intended to use the NLP. So one thing when I work at um, in the work with uh, a lot of people working using EMR data, I noticed a very significant issue happening. So we we have a um, we have many clinicians, we have many, um, you know, uh, researchers are interested in using the NLP for uh, getting information out from the text. Um, and um, the reason they want to use NLP is that um, a lot of, you know, they, they spend, uh, they, they, they're hiring study coordinators, they're hiring um, uh, nurse abstractors or research abstractors or resident fellows. Uh, to creating a cohort, for example, this patient have this, this, this kind of condition, so they build a, a data set. So now that data set was generated, for example, for 2006 patients to 2009. So now they want to see from 2009 to 2012 how to get this data set, uh, how to, you know, uh, scale this data set to the new, uh, new years. And what happened is that um, the nurse abstractor retired, uh, the residents graduated, and the actual, how exactly they're creating that data set, so they have actually, the PI, the clinician have no clue. There's no documentation left behind. And uh, sometimes they also don't have a, they don't really know where the data sets is because the PI is generally not to deal with the actual data sets themselves. It's the statistical program analysis and the statistician really have that data sets. So this is happening a lot. And um, this is giving me a, you know, as a natural language processing person, 
we generally say if you already have a data set being curated from the EMR, I can use that for distance supervision, or I can use that to do a machine learning system to, to train an RP algorithm to automatically scale to the later uh, years. But they, they don't have the data sets, and the se second thing, they don't have the detailed abstraction protocols at all um, appearing anywhere. So this is a, get some issue. And then I just found those picture and the picture from the plus 2015, they show about 50% of the annual US preclinical pre research spend are subject to reproducibility errors. I can almost guarantee in the current EMR based, you know, a lot of at, at least in the US, a lot of people use EMR for their clinical research. I can guarantee the reproducibility, especially the data reproducibility, is very, very low. Um, you know, I so there's a standard. You know, there's the best. Uh, how do I say the um, uh, good practice? Uh, you know, approach. You know, all those things are not really defined yet in the EMR best research. Um, so, so it's this is what I mean. So. So I say in this as you know, if you really want to scale up, if you really want to um, have a, um, a better data reproducibility in clinical research, um, leveraging the practice related data, like EMR data, you need an automatic approach. NLP is the solution for you, natural language processing. Um, so the argument is the traditional manual efforts seldom ensure data reproducibility. And um, we already approved low internal intercode agreement, only 55%. And there's a lack of specification uh, metadata around how the data sets was created. If you want a different institution to reproduce um, the same study, it may, it's very difficult to reproduce that. And also there's a poor traceability associated with the data because the data was the data sets generated using EMR data, this is a come from abstraction process, exactly how the nurse was getting, nurse abstractors was getting the data from EMR to that variable values. They didn't document it. We don't know exactly how that happened. And uh, when we ask the nurse abstract who created the data, some of them tell me they use their instinct um, to, to handle that. And uh, so, so I, as I said, with so much potential for EMR-based things, and this is the um, a number of publications retrieved using natural language processing as the keywords mesh term, and using electronic medical records as the keyword mesh terms, and uh, we see dramatic uh, increase of the EMR appearing uh, retrieved using PubMed records. Um, you know, increase exponentially. But uh, if you look at how many of the, you know, in the PubMed mainline research are using natural language processing uh, keywords, um, they're very it's stable. From 2008 to now, it's actually from 2004 until now, it's like um, flat. So the community not in, uh, increase, and, uh, but there are so much potential of uh, EMR-based research. Um, as I mentioned, if you truly want to have an unbiased study, you must use the clinical uh, information in the clinical notes uh, to have um, results. So issues which we think, um, no, so natural lang language processing, especially on semantics, I generally view this as, as an AI complete problem. Um, just to think about when, when a physician or doctor, they can do independent practice, how many years they needed to spend to gather the experience, gather the uh, knowledge to, to um, do the practice. And in the residence three to seven years period, those which are pragmatic semantics, they gathered during their uh, practice. And if you try to replicate in that intelligence, that level of Pragmatic semantics, context semantics is very challenging. Um, so the issues also face with why we don't do not see many LP related uh, EMR applications. 
Um, there are issues related to the NLP system developed. Um, we did a review uh, of the latest uh, from 2009 to 2016 um, on the use of um, NLP technology to extract information from text we found. There are only a limited number of institutions using the technology, including at least in the US, we have VA, which have um, major, uh, many um, use case of NLP for their technology. We see, um, you know, the I2B2 community, a couple of, you know, only about a handful of institutions uh, use the NLP technology. And, uh, for other institution, when they don't have an active NLP research group there, um, they, they, they cannot really use the technology. And because there's the issue with the NLP system, which produced by um, researchers and uh, how the uh, uh, health IT group um, at the uh, hospital use it. I mean, there's the poor usability associated with it. And majorly, the algorithm has a you know portability issue, and which we'll discuss in in, in the later, and also the generalizability issue. So, consider the syntactic level processing. Um, when you this is actually for the text, of, you know, different from literature. When you have a genial target trend, then when you apply to different biological literature, there's not too much dropping the performance, but when we do the, have a pre-trained part of speech tagging, um, train at the Mayo Clinics data and uh, apply to a different institution, then we have, we see 5% the drop uh, regarding the performance. When you're talking about the uh, um, specific transportability of uh, um, LP algorithm without any customization, you see the original F measure is about at 50% after you have some customization, of course, it's increased. But it, it gives you some point is that if you don't have anyone in that institution know how to do training of an LP system, they cannot really directly use a <coughs> existing module to do their um, data extraction. So I conclude those as there are three kind of variations we observed in the healthcare EMR data. <coughs> what I view as a practice variation. So basically, um, different institution uh, hospitals, first their practice um, process is a, a, a kind of different. They're not the homogeneous and. Uh, <laughs> so they have a different patient population and also different uh, process. And this picture shows you some variation of the, you know, practice difference. Just to show the, you know, there's different colors to show their variations. Um, this is from Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare. And they also have the uh, EMR variations. So um, we are currently have an ongoing study, try to study um, how the EPIC and the CERNA and the GE Healthcare, those are three different systems, how their EMR um, um, documentation uh, impacting the practice. Um, so those are the um, EMR um, physician practice of market share for different kind of EMR system. Uh, all scripts, CE Clinical Works, and the Epic, they are top three uh, EMR um, products. Um, the Mayo Clinic, actually, we currently transition to Epic. Uh, our hi historical EMR, we have GE Healthcare and the Sona. So we will be able to study how those three different EMR systems, how, var how variation they have there. And the most important things, which we call semantic variations, um, and we observe a lot, the, the semantic variation um, dramatically different, the, you know, the number of years. Um, the physician was, um, was in practice, and also the, um, the specialist they are in. So when we, mention, when we talk about, uh, for example, how do we consider patient to have asthma? 
when you ask a primary care physician, um, adults primary care physician, they only consider those which mention asthma in their diagnosis or problem list as the asthma. When you ask about a pediatric um, uh, asthma physicians, they will consider if you have a repeated episode of wheezing, um, you have, you know, um, you know, a repeat multiple times in a year, they will consider those as the asthma patients. So there's a semantic variation depends on who actually read the reports and to come up with conclusions. So we did a study on the clinical documentation variation and NLP system portability using uh, uh, asthma birth cohorts across institutions. So this is just to show you. So there are two systems used. So one is uh, G healthcare, G uh, healthcare G system. What is one EMR, and the other institution um, stands Stanford uh, um, Children House Hospital. They are um, they are using Epic. So we have two different EMR systems. Um, we use the same birth cohort, which means that um, from the patients must be. Uh, born at that hospital and until um, the three years old. So we try to see because those are the first cohort, you know, three years lifespan of a group of kids. We try to see how their clinical EMR uh, notes difference. You know, intuitively there are same group of patients population you know and you know they should have a similar characteristic of a clinical events and a similar character of uh, you know history but what we notice a dramatic difference regarding the number of documents at different institution was created in at the mail we have nine we have ten thousand documents, but in the Sanford uh, um, Children's Hospital, they got 30,000 reports. When you look at the number of tokens, so Sanford, they have five fold more tokens than we have. Um, and the node types, they're dramatically different. So you see a big variation across different institutions regarding how the corpus, how the clinical notes uh, was looking different. If you try to think for EM, uh, um, for EMR uh, for NLP system, you expect the same kind of behavior for this. Um, it can be you know challenging. So this is another showing two different institutions. They're all reading uh, radiology reports, um, but you see if you use that to detect a cohort. So there are two diseases the way that we look. One is a silent brain infection, one is white matter disease. And uh, there are two different um, modality associated with the neural image. One is the CT scan, one is the MRI. And uh, with, you know, when we initially look, if you look, we don't, re so there's the institution difference. If you see the case, so, SBI representing silent brain infection and um, WMD stands for white matter disease. So we created these, uh, you know, cases. So for SBI, we notice about, uh, you know, 7.4% at the Tufts, which is a uh, healthcare institution. So there are 7.4% of the patients which we, in our screening cohort have um, silent brain infection for the Tufts side. When you look at the male, we have 12.5. So uh, it's so this specific study we use the same guidelines, same group of annotators to do cross institution of reading, and we we notice you know there's a patient population difference. So the LP system, if you try to use the LP system developed in one institution to the other institution, you try to see why in the other institution their um, their cases is much smaller on your small provenance than the others. So potential solutions, <laughs> one minute. <laughs> so why is the, we want the, the things, big, biggest challenge we face is the, uh, you know, the data was not open. So the poor reproducibility deal with, you know, the data was not shared. 
So we do not really have the advantage in the by literature mining field where you have one RP system can be used for hand, but uh, at the next we can try to share the data, um, RP algorithms created and through this uh, open house natural language processing consortium. And um, so I'm going to, since I don't have much time, people can read the slides. So um, the second one which we try to do is to try to creating a data set which does not contain PHI information. And if we got those set of sentences at the next, we can try to organize something like uh, um, blah to do the hack sum. Um, and um, so, so the, the paper is, this, all those papers are published. And the research actually currently funded by the NIH to, for this open house natural language processing collaboratory, which we aim to creating uh, data artifacts, I mean, LP artifacts to be shared with the community and to try to develop um, computational phonotopy algorithms for uh, using LP. So I think. Um, the, the, the other thing, as, as, as I said, we're, we're, we're in the practice, we're practice dominant um, institution for, for our RP, we actually in, uh, operationalize in the practice and uh, we have a, um, a infrastructure in place to do RP. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a big data, we have big data infrastructure, we have service infrastructure, we have about 20 people um, team to operationalize our uh, natural language processing for various pro research projects and the practice. So conclusion mark, um, so we, we basically want to say RP is crucial in learning healthcare system and uh, also is crucial to ensure reproducibility of EMR best clinical research. Um, and uh, AI, uh, LP is an AI complete problem and require innovative solutions. Um, so crowdsourcing big data and uh, incorporate diverse source of intelligence. And the major, most importantly, to make LP into the workflow of analysis research operation is the key. And uh, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.